Welcome to the Evangelism Podcast. I'm Daniel King, and I'm excited about telling people about Jesus. And today I am with another great evangelist named Daniel. Daniel Smirnitz from, from Norway. Did I say that right? Oh, you are close. Can you say it the proper? Da yeah, Daniel Smirnitz. Wonderful. And so you are from Norway, and your wife is from Germany. That's right. And we have originally met at uh, ACE Conference, which is the Association of Crusade Evangelists, mm -hmm. led by Jonas Anderson, and originally started by Richard Gunny, mm -hmm. and they have raised up many Scandinavian evangelists, mm -hmm. and also from Great Britain and other parts of, of Europe. Mm -hmm. And so we originally met at that conference, right. and then now we have met again mm -hmm. at the Christ for All Nations Evangelism Boot Camp, which you have just finished, and right now we are in Tanzania. And tell us some of what God has done while you've been here in Tanzania with Christ for All Nations. Oh wow, that's uh, it's. We have been, you know, trained for for three months plus, and then we came down here. And then first of all, we had our initiation, like three weeks, where we were. Uh, trained very practically in preaching the gospel, so we have been into streets, into squares, and just yeah, learning how to preach a gospel message that really works. And it's been amazing to see in every place we have come. You know, people have really come to Jesus; they have turned to Christ, and people are getting healed. We have seen people, you know, uh, there at the street in even a Maasai market getting their their hearing back, their sight back. People have been paralyzed, starting to walk. I mean, the gospel works. So those are the, some of the takeaways that we have really seen throughout the boot camp as well, that we have been boiling it down to the very basic elements and learning really to stick to that because the gospel in itself, the simple gospel really, really, really works. So Christ for All Nations is doing Operation Decapolis, doing multiple mm -hmm. crusades in multiple cities at the same time. Mm -hmm. Which city were you in? Yeah, so we went to Morogoro. A uh, city about just about 300,000 people and uh, yeah there was a lot of things that needed to be done in the city uh, also when it comes to the the unity of the different churches I mean as Christ for All Nation works they work with a multiple denominations they are not specifically towards the Pentecostal or the Mennonites or the Baptists so gathering them has been one of the most beautiful things that I've seen that Christ for All Nation is bringing to the church as we came into Morogoro, the unity across the denominations and the love that has been forged out of that also in the aftermath uh, while working together to put up a successful gospel crusade. And so how was the crusade in Morogoro? What, what did you see there? Yeah, so we had a five-day crusade. Uh, planning up to the crusade was uh, around altogether three months and I joined in for the last five weeks uh, it was really, really amazing to see just how many parts and nuts and bolts need to be in place to really see it come to pass. And so we had uh, uh, a beautiful field there uh, with the mountains surrounding us and also when all the promotion and all the work has been done, you know, the multitude started to stream into this field and the, you know, the gospel was preached and God was starting to move in a very significant way. We saw. I think around 11,000 people during those five days turning to Christ and mighty miracles taking place as well. Uh, people coming, you know, who couldn't walk, they started to walk. People who came deaf starting to hear and uh, it's just beautiful. So let's go to the beginning of your story. Mm -hmm. How did you first become passionate about evangelism? Yeah, I, I, for me, it really landed in my heart as a 17-year-old when I received Jesus. Uh, just, you know, my eyes, when I, when I met Jesus, I didn't really know that this is a relationship, that Jesus is really a person that you can get to know. And from that moment, I had a burning desire to tell others about Jesus. You know, I was, you know, grown up with religion in a sense. And so that discovery just placed up passion and a burning desire in me for my classmates to meet Jesus. I started to go out in the streets with one of the local churches. Every week, you know, in the night we would have outreach uh, to reach a city in Norway called Bergen. And uh, from there it's just been evolving and evolving year after year. And God started to speak very early to me about the nations, even though I didn't really understand how that would unfold. It was just placed inside of me. 
And going through different Bible school and training, I was led into a ministry called Jesus Revolution, which is based in, uh, in Norway, in Oslo, but it's very international. We focus mostly on the young people and the youth in Europe. So that was one of my first stepping stones into really traveling around to the different nations. We had, uh, yeah, we reached out through different means, but it was mainly through uh, music and through dramas and doing different things as a like a tool in the hand of the local church to reach out to their community. So we travel around there and preaching also like a gospel message, praying for the sick and basically doing the work of an evangelist over a four year period when I was there in, in Jesus uh, revolution. And also there God started to speak to me about other countries outside of Europe. I never, even as I grew up, I never traveled a lot. You know, I always had his heart that I want to travel. And I think the Lord also has put that in me since that time. And uh, since then, I've seen, you know, like how the Lord has just been opening doors, you know, to, to India and Mongolia and Vietnam and uh, different parts of Africa, Kenya and Ethiopia and the West African countries as well. And um, so we founded a ministry after, you know, I came back from Jesus Revolution, came back to my local church. I was not a Christian at that time, uh, but I started, you know, to help there to build up the youth work in that church at the same time, starting to travel and to do crusade ministry. Uh, towards Asia especially and some places also in in Africa and then uh, I joined as you mentioned earlier Jonas uh, Anderson and go out mission in Sweden so I was there together with that beautiful family for about four four and a half years until we eventually started our own ministry that is called Jesus to all nations in 2018 so that's shortly some part of our journey yeah and so let's <coughs> talk about the future You've started this ministry, Jesus to all nations, which I say amen to that. Yeah. <laughs> Jesus needs to go to every nation we, and we Easy. must take him. Amen. So what do you see God doing through the ministry in the future? What, what dreams has God put in your heart? Yeah. So what I really sensed, you know, when COVID really hits, you know, um, in two, in, into 2020, I really felt that this decade is going to be very significant. And so, and then COVID hit, we had to pack that out. We were supposed to have a crusade in Burkina Faso, but we had to shut that down due to both a terrorist attack, but also uh, COVID hit really strong. So we had to actually get out of the country really fast. And coming home, I was sitting in my lean chair and I was just contemplating on the, what's happening. And I felt several things, but two things that I really felt in my heart was uh, a grief, how casually I've been taking the um, yeah, the, the privilege to preach the gospel to the nations with free, the freedom that we have had up to that point. And then the second thing in my heart, it was like a resolution coming up. I think also just force and coming in the Holy Spirit that over the next decade, I want to see 10 million people coming into the kingdom of God. So that is kind of what we are moving towards. And then the Lord led Catherine and I, Catherine is my wife, uh, to, to link up also with Christ for all nations through the boot camp. And through that also we will do, probably together with, uh, with Christ for All Nations, we will do some initiatives through the Decapolis project that is uh, ongoing. Uh, so that is one of the things. And also with the Kids Crusades, we will be linked together with Christ for All Nations there somehow. And then of course we will continue to do our own crusades and training evangelists for this time as well to really to be able to see a mighty harvest coming, especially now over the next decade. I believe it's going to be when things are starting to open up, I think uh, ministries that has been casual about being able to go out will really put in, you know, their full strength. And even during this season, I think that things are that the dross has been taken off, so that you are actually being sharpened to be able to do exactly what the Lord wants you to do for the next season. So I feel for us, uh, it's we we're gonna give it all, especially now this decade up to 2030 for the 10 million for our sake, uh, and so we we. We need to mobilize and we need to go. Yeah. Amen. What are some of the big takeaways from the evangelism boot camp? What have you learned there? Yeah. Uh, before uh, the boot camp, you know, like as an evangelist, you at some points you can find yourself very lonely. I think the evangelist and also the prophetic ministry is kind of a loner ministry. And um, even in my own mind, because of maybe what pastors and leaders also have told or like the, sometimes I felt that people they look down a little bit at the evangelists uh, but what I really felt one of the biggest takeaways is just the 
uh, the dignity and the honor it is to be called as an evangelist, you know, and what Christ for All Nations really have put inside of me is just the reverence and the respect for the office of the evangelist. They have really uh, been uh, showing how that is, you know, and also showing us what an evangelistic ministry really looks like and what it can be done. So that has been one of the biggest takeaways for me personally. But also to, to see how you can actually reach the multitudes with the gospel, to learn the ins and the outs. And uh, it takes a lot, you know, to put up what Christ for All Nations are doing, what you yourself are doing, you know. And I've been doing some of it, but not in the scale that you guys have been at this point. But just to be on the other end of it, to learn from the ground, uh, you know, when it comes to training the volunteers, meeting the pastors and bishops, you know, and seeing, you know, how everything comes up from the ground. Uh, where you're gonna have a, a crusade that has been the biggest takeaway for me and also just altering everything when it comes to how we can do this in the future what to look for when things are not going well and be able even to navigate that and to put on these crusades ourselves for the coming season you've been to quite a few different nations like you mentioned vietnam and in mm. west africa mm. um, what are some of the areas that you would most like to be involved in? And what are some of the things that you, you've seen God do in some of these different places? Mm. So God called me really to specifically the, the least fortunate, the least reached places when I was, uh, att attended a crusade in India in 2012. Um, and so India is very much on my heart due to, you know, we have around 17,700 people groups now on the planet and 2,700 of those are located in India alone and at least this is what Joshua Project's numbers are saying, you know, around 2,300 uh, of those people groups are still counted unreached, uh, meaning there's less than 2% Christians, you know, evangelical Christians within each of those people groups. So, so I feel I have a very strong uh, pull towards those places where no one else goes to. I don't like when we are holding like the 50th crusade in the same city, even though we, I believe in preaching the gospel. I really want to go to those places where they haven't even heard the gospel once. Uh, but also to see, you know, because the people groups, they are growing and we need to be able to see a massive harvest within the people groups because they are outnumbering the work and the labor force that we are doing and that's partly why we also been connected with Christ for all nations so but uh, yeah so in India for example you know we've been reaching out up to the foot of Himalaya a place called Assam I've uh, been there uh, multiple times and it's just been really beautiful to see you know coming with the gospel into a place where you have both radical Islam and you have also uh, a very strong seat of radical Hinduism there and then you have also the tribal clashes going on between the different tribes and um, I feel the darker it gets the more God loves just to both show up and to come in and to really free up and, and liberate a whole community and uh, what I love especially about India is they are taught you know to sacrifice to their gods which in their brain or in their minds <laughs> also are demonic entities and when you come in there and you preach the gospel and you preach Jesus as the final sacrifice, it's very mind-blowing to them to see. And when you preach that kind of a message, you just see the, the, the pennies dropping in their hearts and also just saying to them, hey, Jesus, he also gives you the power over these demonic powers. When you receive Jesus, he gives you the authority and the power. You don't have to be afraid. You don't have to sacrifice to appease them. And, and all these things because they live under a tremendous pressure and fear and so the gospel is really really matchless yeah so you're from Norway your wife is from Germany and so you are in Europe and Europe has a wonderful Christian heritage there have been many wonderful Christians in Europe but now Europe is often called a post-Christian uh, area uh, where it used to be Christian but now there's not so much interest in Jesus yeah. what do you think it will take to evangelize Europe once yeah. again yeah that's a very good question and I have the privilege to travel in most of the countries in Europe and preach the gospel and what I found and I think this is like a common thing when it comes to preaching the gospel in any place or to any culture we need to come more than with just words 
we need to have the power. We need to bring, you know, as the Bible says, signs, wonders, and miracles shall follow us as we preach the word. And uh, me, I can speak for myself. And before I was a Christian, I I could not stand just empty words or just the motions or the religious acts or going to a church and there is nothing in it. And I see that Europe is a, is a is a continent that is longing for the real Jesus, but he is seldomly presented the way that he really is. And also that he is a living being that is really interested in them. So they need that aspect. But I also need to see that he actually is a God who is uh, interested in all aspects of their lives and also where they can really experience him. Uh, so I think to, for at least for me and for us as evangelists to bring to people an experience of who Jesus is, is very important alongside with the preaching of the word and sharing the gospel. Some of course the ap apologetic side to it, but that only works to a certain extent. There needs to be a real tangible evidence to the person, the presence of Jesus. Mm. Let's talk about your family. Your wife is going to have a baby very soon. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, you're at about seven months. Mm -hmm. And so uh, now you will be a, a father for the first time. And I'm a big believer that God does not mm -hmm. just call individuals. He calls families. Amen. And so the calling that is upon your life is, is also upon your whole family. And in God, God's a generational God. He will bless your child just as he's, he's blessed you. So what do you think will change as you start to have children and continue to be in ministry? What, what, what are you thinking about that? I was thinking to ask you that question. <laughs> well, um, let me say it like this. This is our first child, so I don't really know exactly what to expect in every, and I think also every family is different. Every dynamic of family is different. So you kind of, you have to, like in everything with the calling, you, you walk out your calling in relationship with God and also now when we've been married with my wife, we are, we are kind of figuring out that walk with the Lord and now with the child, there will be a, an extension to that to find out how we're going to do it. Uh, but I think that we have, we have spoken together, we have decided that our lives, they are not to be revolving because I see that in many people's life when they have a child, their life revolves around the child or the children which is understandable to a certain extent, but we just have decided that we want to take our child and bring that child into our life and give them, you know, give this child that we're having now in August, the upbringing and the childhood that yeah. uh, he should have, but we want to bring the child along. So already next year, we are planning already to bring the child with us onto the missions field. We don't think that having children is a, is a burden to us, even though there is demands with having children for sure. So, but I, I really believe that the grace of God will be extended to, as you said, God is into families. He's a, he's a God of family. He, he loves family. He, that's what he made us for. And so I, I think uh, we will we will see in some months how it will yeah. turn out. But we decided that we don't want to kind of just settle down and uh, and stop up everything. Even may, maybe things will go a little bit slower. Maybe. I don't know. We will see. But uh, definitely we want to bring the child into what we are doing and uh, we'll see how the Lord will lead us in that. Yeah. So my parents were missionaries in the country of Mexico. Mm. We moved there when I was 10 years old mm. and I just grew up ministering right alongside them, yes. which it was normal in our family to be part of the ministry. Mm. And that's really wonderful because it gave me lots of experience ministering and at first I was just helping to set up the chairs and set up the sound system. And, but then later my father would ask me to share a testimony for five minutes or to prepare a little message and I would share that. And, and so before I was like 15 or 16, I already loved to preach the gospel and God put that in my heart. And so I, I think that's just wonderful to include your children mm -hmm. in, in what you do. And, mm -hmm. and of course now I have two children. My son Caleb is 11, my daughter, Katie is nine, mm. and they're in school most of the year, but we try to take them on at least one big missions trip a year yeah. so that they can participate. Mm. And I was praying for God to give me a cameraman in my ministry. Mm. And so on the last trip, my son Caleb took the camera and he took it very seriously. He took lots of good pictures. That's beautiful. And uh, my daughter was helping to lead worship in the women's conference and everything. And, and so I think it's just really wonderful. And, and as they grow up, we we know that God's calling us upon their life and they will, will serve God. And, and there's no reason 
for children to just stay at home. Mm. Why not ask them to be a part of what God is doing? Yeah, God, God has a great plan for the children. Mm. So your, the name of your ministry is, is Jesus for All Nations. Do you have a website if people yeah. would like to know more about you? Yeah, it's uh, www and it's jtans, J-T-A-N-S dot com. You can go there and uh, you also find us on Instagram and Facebook yeah, as well. Wonderful. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for being a guest on the Evangelism Podcast. Oh, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure for me. It's great to be with you. God bless you. God bless you. Daniel King is on a mission to save one million souls a year, but he can't do it alone. Would you consider sowing a financial seed today? To give, please visit www.kingministries.com.